No forgiveness! No mercy! Never! Hello everybody and welcome back to some more of I the Somnium Files Explained. Although, we're not specifically explaining the contents of the first game, as I know I have some timelines I need to finish, and I promise you I will be getting to those. However, as seen by my upload the other day, the ARG for the sequel to the Somnium Files, the Nirvana Initiative, has started up. For the purposes of clarification, this project is going to be titled Hidden Bats, similar to how the first ARG was titled Lemniscate. This is to help differentiate the story of the ARG from the story of the game itself. With that out of the way, I want to stress that this ARG is very much ongoing and the nature of information and context will shift as more information is revealed and more events happen. So take anything moving forward with a grain of salt and with this knowledge. Before we go into recent coverage, I feel it's important to cover at least on a basic level the story we've seen thus far in the trailers including the very beginning. This is going to include information from my previous news videos on Nirvana Initiative, so if you've seen those, this will be familiar and a nice refresher. And if you haven't, well, here it is all in one location. June 28, 2021 was a crazy period of time in the Uchikoshi fandom. This is the fifth anniversary of Zero Time Dilemma's release, and Spike Chunsoft decided they wanted to play with fire. They posted a strange graphic on their Twitter of nine severed eyeballs with the caption, Truth is only an illusion. Can you see past it? Hashtag Nine Eyes TV. The link to their website brought players to a new subsection of the Spike Chunsoft website with those same nine eyes floating with a bloody background. It wasn't immediately clear what this exactly was for, but the number nine me present hinted to players it was related in some way to Zero Escape, as 9 is what's known as an arc number for that series, a number so significant that it appears quite often. Hell, the first game of the series is dubbed 999 colloquially, 9 hours, 9 persons, 9 doors, 9 is everywhere in Zero Escape. However, since I the Somnium Files was the last recent big solo project from this team, plenty of people, myself included, thought this was a teaser for the sequel to the Somnium Files. I mean, eyeballs are a very distinct symbol for the first game, and the word I is a homophone for the game title, I. Now, reflected in each of these eyeballs were nine codes hidden behind different types of puzzles, and when solving each of the nine puzzles, the password Nirvana Initiative is revealed. Entering the password showed a skull with a countdown across its eyes. It was counting down from 48 hours in total minutes. Now, clever internet user Benjamin Herrera on Twitter looked into the site's source code and found that the page on the website was listed as I Nirvana. Once the countdown was over, the revealed trailer for I the Somnium Files Nirvana Initiative was showcased. The video begins with a new Spike Chunsoft logo. They tend to update these for Uchikoshi projects, like how I once had a spear impaling itself on the skull's eye. Though here, the skull is cleaved into two different halves, as a small laugh plays in the background. And then, oh boy, we get a few bombshells. And older Mizuki Okiura is playing 999 on an in-universe equivalent to a PS Vita or Nintendo Switch. It's not exactly one or the other, kind of like a mix. I have thoughts on this right here, but let me tell you that in a minute, though. But Mizuki is humming the melody of the Invincible Rainbow Arrow song as Unary Game from 999 soundtrack plays in the background. It looks as if she's just starting the game in the first escape room puzzle. Although it is impossible to know if this is from her just beginning the game from scratch, or coming from having cleared one of the game's other endings. As if you aren't aware, 999 and the other Zero Escape titles have multiple endings, and once you clear them, you are sent back to the beginning. 
It is funny to note though that this is the new version of the game included in the Nonary games, as we can tell via its UI. You should totally buy the Nonary games, as it's frequently on sale and contains two of the game's best stories in one package. By the way. On the back of Mizuki's console, we can see a sticker of Ada Rabbit, a neat little tie to both her character in universe and also a reference to Zero Third from Virtue's Last Reward, as that is what Ada Rabbit is in reference to. Interesting, and perhaps the most striking element from this trailer, if you're not a nut for Zero Escape lore like I am, we hear the voice of Aiba, but we don't see Date anywhere. Aiba even says Mizuki needs to take this mission more seriously because she's not like Date. But strangely, the way she speaks about him is as if he's no longer around. Mizuki reveals she's teched up her metal pipe, and she has the Aiba implant replacing her left eye. And then cut to title reveal, as well as a specific destination that this is by Team Zero Escape. Now, this is huge. This is the first time that we've heard of this group as Team Zero Escape, working on these Uchikoshi projects at Spike Chunsoft. And it's so weird they would start calling them that now, especially since Uchikoshi is primarily working at Tokyo Games now on his projects such as World's End Club and Tribe 9, Kazutaka Kodaka of Danganronpa now. And Zero Escape as a series is supposed to be finished. So the question is, why? Why would they specify this now and not for, say, the Nonary Games release or Zero Time Dilemma? or for the first Somnium Files game. What about now brings about this decision? So, for now, the universe of Zero Escape exists as a fictional property within the world of I, the Somnium Files. We saw this back in I1, where I pointed out that there were advertisements for both projects in Shibuya's loading screen, and there is also a reference to Gintaro Hangu from 999 within the Matsushita Diner within Mayumi Somnium, Initially, these are cute easter eggs, but now, are they just easter eggs, or is there more to this? I won't go too in-depth with this theory, as it involves major, major spoilers for the entire Zero Escape trilogy, but I'm gonna simply refer to a character named Kyle that people who know will know what I'm talking about. I believe this subtly reveals the fact that Mizuki is playing the role of Kyle by literally playing 999 in a scene. I can't explain any further than that. Whatever I do, Zero Escape explains all return to this point and explain it in way more detail. But for now, with that out of the way, we learned that this game is going to be releasing in 2022 sometime in the spring. Next up, we have a new trailer that launched on January 27th, 2022. Yes, we did go an entire half a year without any bit of news whatsoever. I'm fine. This is fine. This is perfectly fine. In this trailer, we pan out to a baseball stadium with an older Mizuki. She recognizes a corpse that is sorrowful over its discovery, and then confirms this corpse is only one half of a corpse. We then cut to a television station, where we see that things are immediately interesting here. Iris and Mizuki are here visiting the station, but it's distinctly not the Mizuki we were just with. This is the Mizuki of six years in the past. Ergo, this scene here is shortly after the events of I-1. And so we're going to have two time periods where the story is going to be happening six years before and present day. To avoid confusion from this place forward, I'm going to refer to the time where Mizuki is older as the present, and the time shortly after I-1 as six years in the past, or just the past. I know it's tricky having spent so much time with I-1 that you might think of this time as the present, but we'll go like this for consistency's sake. Now, we see an explosion in the TV studio, which is named a Maybe TV. Iris has a quote about body teleporting from a parallel world, which brings to mind the half-body we saw from the baseball stadium. So it seems that one half of this corpse was discovered by the explosion in the TV studio in the past, and the other half showed up in the baseball stadium in the present, as Mizuki was here to witness both. It would make sense that she would recognize the other half of the corpse. We also see Boss here, implying Abyss is involved in this case even before the discovery of the half-corpse. And then we get a newcomer. This is Karuta Ryuki. He's an agent with Abyss, and a sinker like Konami Date was, although he's noted to be a new sinker, and more of a rookie investigator. And his personality is said to be a bit more reserved and gentle, which contrasts with his own AI unit that's implanted in his left eye, Tama. She's said to be very stern and motherly, but also has a sadistic side. One note about Ryuki that's important is that both of his parents and his brother are both deceased, an event that has left a lasting scar on him. 
Now, also interestingly enough, we hear Pewter's voice in the present time talking about how half of the body is an exact match genetically with the right half that was found six years prior. Very interesting. Then there's a blink and you miss a moment where severed eyeballs are lined up in a row. Now, we can only see seven eyes here in this shot, but it wouldn't be too far stretched to assume that there's nine of them in total. Although, it's very strange that the three on the right here are colored with a bluish-green kind of tint. Whatever the reason, the idea of Nine Eyes TV is still going to be very much important. We get some more information from Tama and Aiba discussing the discovery of the murder, as there was no evidence of the body being frozen, it was fresh on both sides, even though they were six years apart the discovery. So Iris' theory of it appearing from a parallel universe might hold some water. We get some strange visuals with some distorted backgrounds. We'll come out of these later as the Hidden Bats videos, the eponym of the ARG. We'll talk more about those later though. Now, here, I want you to look at this image. We have Ryuki and Mizuki as she appears in the present, sinking up. Notice how Ryuki looks the same as he did six years ago. As we can see, the introduction is in the TV studio in the past. But this scene here is the only time in any of these trailers we see Ryuki in the present and Mizuki together. That's because Ryuki is going to be one of our focal POV characters in the past, and Mizuki is going to be our focal POV character in the present. Although there are some sections later on that show we have some POV with Mizuki in the past, but we have not yet seen Ryuki in the present be a POV character. Get some more out of context quotes, leaning toward the idea that there being a hidden message within the Hidden Bats videos, and that deciphering it would unveil the secrets of the world. We get a visual clue to this split in time, with the text all referencing past and present coming and intersecting it together. And now we juxtapose Tama and Aipa together as they activate their Somnium scans. Here we get a look at Kanami Date, who now dons an eye patch. It's likely that the Aipa model Mizuki has is the original and not a copy made just for Mizuki. So something happened that Date is no longer with the MPD in Abyss. And boy howdy do I have thoughts on that later. I want to mention that this character is going to be important in my talks later. This is Tokiko Shigure. She works in secret and can be seen with a bodyguard and offers up very occult-esque hand signs. On March 10th, we got some new information from Famitsu which held a secret QR code, which led to a secret video titled Free to Free. This video is 42 seconds long and was uploaded on December 6th, 2021, on a channel titled DB. Interestingly enough, DB is the alphanumeric equivalent to 42. D equals 4 and B equals 2. Also, the letters D and B are mirror images of each other, kind of like a reflection split, how we saw with the eye logo and the skull in the Spike Jinsop logo. There are also interesting connections we'll talk about later, but another reading of this channel could reference D.B. Cooper, one of the most infamous missing person cases of all time. The video shows cryptic imagery, which was featured in the trailer, and implies hidden messages within. This style of video will continue with the other Hidden Best videos. The Famitsu article also reveals the name of the person the corpse belonged to, Jin Furure. He is noted to being the president of an organization known as Music Food. Not really sure if that's an accurate translation, but we'll go for it for now. Next, on April 5th came the next trailer that followed up on information brought about in Famitsu. The Spike Chunsoft logo once again is displayed in a unique fashion, hosted on nine television sets arranged in a 3x3 square. Again, Keep this in mind as we're going to be seeing this set up again real soon. This is of course calling back to the Nine Eyes TV slogan we first learned about the game with. The trailer begins confirming Jin Furure's name and the full name of the studio, Studio DeVita. Mizuki explains her desire to know about more the case as it changed her life permanently, referring to her missing eye. It's likely that the event where she loses her left eye happens during the initial scene of the studio. Also note here, one of Momo Kumakura's goons, as well as Momo himself, is present at the studio for the game show being presented. Here we see Ryuki questioning Tokiko Shigure about a number of topics, but we can glean some information. She knows the victim, Jin, as she refers to him by name when Ryuki asked where Tokiko was around 6am on the 9th. Another thing is that Ryuki has an option to ask Tokiko about the Bats 490 video, a topic we'll return to soon enough when we return to modern day events. Here we see a sign inside Ryuki's VR investigation posted on the right half of Jin's corpse that shows the Frey to Free QR code much clearer. Next we got a scene of Ryuki investigating what looks like to be a laboratory. 
In truth, this is the Horidori Institute of Genetics, which is run by Jakari Horidori. Here we learn of a new gameplay mechanic of Wink Sync, where Ryuki is able to confirm if a subject is lying or not without needing to be full on sync with them. The subject at hand is essentially if Chikari has seen the Bats 490 video, which Ryuki is able to confirm that Chikari has indeed seen it. We move forward and find that Ryuki is going to sync with Chikara anyway, but the scene it transitions to is actually a clever edit, as it's Aiba exploring this sync, and is in fact a continuation from the scene in the last trailer where Ryuki and Mizuki are syncing together, which Mizuki being the sinker here. We can tell this is Ryuki Somnium because of Abyss Great Evolver here, and the interrogation room, as well as Ryuki appearing in the Somnium. It's likely his Somnium surrounds the event that killed his parents and his brother, as he harbors massive amounts of guilt over it. The interrogation room implies it's possible he was interrogated over the incident, which definitely would inspire traumatic memories over the situation. We return to Studio DeVita in the moment the corpse appeared on the scene, and we can confirm that Momo Kumakura is here on the scene, and everyone from the last trailer is also present. Then in this next scene we have Mizuki from the past fighting off some goons in hazmat suits. Except, those suits look familiar. Yes, those suits are 100% identical to the hazmat suits as seen in Virtue's Last Reward. I won't say where they appear or why, because it is related to spoilers, but this again brings to light another illusion to Zero Escape, which just has no specific reason that we can see immediately, so... So strange to this point, I find it hard to believe it's anything else other than intentional. We get a blink and you miss a segment where Ryuki deduces that the right half of the corpse is missing one of its back teeth, and a scene of Pewter in the sink room in the past where he confirms that Mizuki lost two very precious things due to that incident. And it's confirmed here that we're actually going to be seeing through Mizuki's eyes six years ago as well, and not just Ryuki's like I mentioned before. Then here through Ryuki's eyes, Tom explains the Batport 90 video decoded message leads to a research institute i.e. the Horidori Genetics Institute we saw earlier in the trailer, confirming a connection between the two. Then we see Mizuki in the same facility in the present, surrounded by a large number of figures in the hazmat suits from Virtue's Last Reward, solidifying a connection between these parties. Interesting though, that in the present, so they are throughout both in the past and in the now times. Then we get a look at Iris and Mame Doi in the Sakiba Girls High School, although it's a bit weird since it's in the past since it's Ryuki talks to them, but we know that Amame is older than a high school student by the end of the first eye game, so it's unclear why she's here. Um, I guess that'll be answered in the game, maybe she was just held back a lot. <laughs> the trailer ends with more out of context quotes and a confirmation of the release date of June 24th, 2022. A slight delay from the spring 2022 deadline as that's technically summer by the exact wording of it. Now, from this point on, things were relatively quiet until recent. Beginning on May 5th, the Spike Chunsoft Twitter account posted a link to the strange website dubbed the Sonaiku Foundation. Now, this is a minefield for lore and theorycrafting. First, we'll go over the details of the website, and then we'll dive into theorycraft territory next. I'm going to start with a page that Spike Chunsoft Tweet linked to, as it's a subpage of the Sonaiku Foundation website and not the homepage, and it's titled Hidden Bat. We saw nine television sets arranged in a square, and hey now, I see where this is coming back around. We had another 48 hour countdown as well as a single video being able to be played in the center monitor with two hourglasses taking up the top left and the bottom right monitors. The video in the center was labeled BATS489 and was uploaded unlisted by another hidden YouTube channel titled Hidden Bats. There's also a new Twitter account that linked to this hidden page similarly titled Hidden Bats. The BATS489 video is 3 minutes and 45 seconds long and features a similar video style as the Bats 490 video in Free 2 Free. Except this time, there are polygonal animals and shapes accompanied by letters and symbols in an obvious effort to hide coded messages. I'm not going to go through and explain every single combination as that work has already been done by Mori and that Skitty Pink over in the Eye of the Somnium Files Uchikoshi Somnium Discord. There is an Excel sheet that has been made up that covers every single code in the video, and I'm going to link it down below. Next, we're going to move back to the main page of the Sonaiku Foundation, as there's plenty here for us to discuss. The top of the page shows a background image of a rainbow with the message, We are dedicated to resolving missing persons cases as quickly as possible. Headings up top show the Sonaiku Foundation logo, news, about, and patrons. Patrons is the link that leads to the Hidden Bats subpage, 
meaning the creators of the Hidden Best videos are benefactors for the Sonaiku Foundation. Which isn't great. So we have a direct link from the Sonaiku Foundation to the Hidden Bats videos to the Horadora Research Institute. Keep this connection in mind. I will be following it up in the theory section of this video. Anyway, heading to the news section, we get quite a few topics the Sonaiku Foundation has updated on during the month of April. April 1st, 2022, PDT. Kagura Iwato appointed president. Sonaiku Foundation is pleased to announce that Kagura Iwato has been appointed to the position of president, effective April 1st. Below are Iwato's remarks on the appointment. The primary goal of the Sonaiku Foundation is to assist in solving missing persons cases that cause so much misery and sadness. As representative of the Foundation, I intend to fulfill my duty to this noble cause. For all those who want their loved ones back in their lives, for all the missing ones who wish to return home, I will lead this foundation with the utmost effort to bring them peace. Kagura Iwato, president of the Sonaiku Foundation. Okay, interesting. They announced a new president on April Fools of this year. Strange choice for a date, but it is a really recent endeavor. And then we move forward. April 6th, 2022, PDT. Missing Persons Task Force established. Sonaiku Foundation has announced the creation of the Missing Persons Task Force, effective April 7th. The Missing Persons Task Force is a specialized team within Sonaiku Foundation composed of former police officers who will be working around the clock to assist in the prompt resolution of cases. We at Sonaiku Foundation are confident that this elite task force is capable of resolving missing persons cases during the crucial initial stages. Please offer your best wishes to their success. Working with former police officers. That is interesting. Again, I'll be running back to this fact here in the theory section. Keep this in mind. April 13th, 2022. PDT. Missing person A found and rescued. Earlier today, our missing persons task force found and rescued an individual who was reported missing, hereafter referred to as A to protect their identity, in the mountains of Chichibu City, Saitama Prefecture. A was delivered to the police and emergency services after their rescue. We have been told they are in good health both physically and mentally, and their family has been contacted. We are proud that our actions led to this favorable outcome. We will continue to find missing persons with renewed vigor and resolve. This is strange. They found a missing person, but won't reveal their identity. I mean, it's possible they're keeping them under the wraps to protect them from future similar cases, but it just seems fishy. But, I mean, if they contacted their parents, then I guess all the people that need to know need to know. But we'll keep this in mind. April 19th, 2022. PDT. Disappearance of President Kagura Iwato. Sonaiku Foundation would like to comment on the emerging news that President Kagura Iwato has gone missing. We regretfully must confirm the reports are true. We have already filed a missing persons report to law enforcement. Our missing persons task force is coordinating with the police to aid the effort to find Iwato. If anyone has any pertinent information, no matter how minor or inconsequential it may seem, please contact the foundation immediately. And not three weeks after the new president was appointed, does he too go missing? I'm starting to not like the sound of this. And finally, the most current news report as of this writing. May 6th, 2022. PDT. Disappearance of Aine Ichirai and Binato Sotobara. The Foundation has received information regarding two missing persons. Missing person reports have already been filed with law enforcement. The persons in question are as follows. Ms. Aine Ichirai, high school student, Saitama Prefecture. Mr. Binato Sotobara, university student, Saitama Prefecture. We at Sonaiku Foundation are fully cooperating with ongoing investigation into these cases. If anyone has any pertinent information, no matter how minor or inconsequential it may seem, please contact the Foundation immediately. Hmm, here we have something new. We have two photographs of a high school student and a university student from the Saitama Prefecture area. Aine Ichirai and Binanto Sotobara. This is strange. The pictures of these characters don't match Yusuke Kozaki's style, the character designs we know from Ida Somnia files and the new characters we have seen so far in Nirvana Initiative. I'm not sure what this means, but fun fact, if you take the initials of these characters, 
AI and BS. You can use it to spell out Abyss. Not sure exactly what relation that has, but it's interesting. Well, with that news out of the way, let's get to the About section. You want to eliminate the tragedy of disappearances. You want to erase the sorrow caused by disappearances. You want to eradicate the misfortune of disappearances completely from this world. We at the Sanaika Foundation are committed to being a beacon of light for those who are lost and those who have lost others. We are engaged day and night in search and support to bring missing persons cases to their resolutions. Now, I know they're trying to be positive and resound and strong, but erasing sorrow and eliminating tragedy are very villainous like terms to be talking about making people happier. I mean, at least with everything else going on it does. Now, down here are something interesting. The Seneku Foundation was established October 28, 1943. This is the same day as an incident known as the Philadelphia Experiment. The Philadelphia Experiment is a little involved, so let me break it down. In 1943, an experiment was supposed to have taken place at the Philadelphia Naval Shipyard on October 28, aboard the SS Eldridge. A naval officer by the name of Carl M. Allen said he was a personal witness to the strange phenomena involved in the experiment to make the ship itself invisible, a tactic to increase their espionage and hopefully close out the Second World War. The experiment proposed the fields of electromagnetism and gravity could be bent and refracted around a physical object in which to make that object become completely invisible. Reportedly, the ship itself had found limited success in the experiment and the crew members reported seeing a greenish fog appear where the ship had at one point been. However, the craziest part was the Eldridge had not only vanished, but had entirely teleported away to Norfolk, Virginia, some 200 miles away from the Philadelphia Naval Shipyard, before returning about some 10 minutes later at the site it originally occupied. It was also said that the ship had teleported back approximately 10 minutes in time. Word had spread that the workers aboard the ship were frozen in place and became intangible. Some had said people had become fused to bulkheads, gone insane, and otherwise had rematerialized inside out during the act of teleportation. Now, here we have some interesting ideas being put forward. We have a supposed ability to teleport through time and space without discernible reason, physical malfunction to the human body during this happening and halves of bodies appearing out of nowhere in a certain period of time in the past. Very, very interesting. And even more so, we have a foundation that is established on this exact same day. And if we continue down past the names, we can see that they have an American branch in Philadelphia. <sighs> Other points of note here is that the chairman of the board, Hasumi Kisabragi, is a direct reference to a Japanese creepypasta that tells the story of a character named Hisumi who goes missing in a location named Kisaragi Station, so another direct allusion to missing persons cases. Everything about Sanaiku is centered around phenomena of missing people, and going forward with that, American branch director Polly B. Mary, Polly B. Polly B. Polybius. Polybius is another urban legend of a mysterious arcade game known simply as Polybius that was said to be created by some high-level men in black types that would alter and change your brain as you played it, a la brainwashing or mind control. Sort of similar in style to the Hidden Bats videos. On May 7th at 10pm EST, the timer on the Hidden Bats page hit zero and we got the next step of the ARG on our hands. The page changed and we now have some new information to work with. The two monitors with the hourglasses now contain two names that should be familiar to you now. Aine Ichirai and Binato Sotabara. These are the two students that we saw as missing on the Sonaiku Foundation website. The top and the bottom monitors now show About and Answers. About gives us the rules of this step of the game. This is a case, a plan, an experiment. Aine Ichirai and Binato Sotabara are locked up in hidden rooms. Placed in each room is a smartphone which is only activated for 21 minutes at a fixed time at a fixed time, once every two days, and a box with a nine-digit lock. The phone cannot be used freely. The box cannot be opened without solving a riddle. Please help us save them both. With your help, we can resolve this in the best possible way. How to. Compare information from the missing person and the Bats 489 video. The answer is the Nirvana spell. 
If the Nirvana spell is correct, a nine-digit number will be displayed. When that number is communicated directly to the missing person, the plan will proceed. After this, two new Twitter accounts go live at the same time, at Aine Ichirai and at Binato Sotobara. Aine begins tweeting first, both in Japanese and in English. Where am I? I'm trapped! Somebody help! I'm in a dark room with no windows. I'm so scared right now. I was going home with everyone from cram school. I remember buying chocolate at the convenience store. Nothing after. I seriously can't remember anything. Was I kidnapped? My head hurts so bad. Some kind of box here. It has buttons with numbers. There's a piece of paper that says solve the puzzle. What is this? I'm supposed to solve a riddle to escape? Please, anyone can see this. I need your help. I have to enter a nine-digit code on the box. Is it a riddle? Please, if you know the number, reply and tell me. Please, I don't want to die here. The image on the last tweet is exactly what the players needed to help out. It showed an image of a blue snake, a yellow penguin, and a white giraffe. Using the Excel document made up, compiled the animals and symbols, the code PAN was found. Using this, you would click on the bottom monitor that says ANSWER on the website to enter the Nirvana spell. Also, keep in mind that wording. I have thoughts on that later. After inputting PAN, we get a 9-digit number, 77-8888-153. But we're unable to get a response from Aine before her phone shut off. It's unknown at this time if she was successful in unlocking the box. Well done. Please reply to Aine Ichirai with the following nine digits. Until next time. After 21 minutes passed, Aine's phone shut off and we didn't hear anything about Binato for the entirety of the night. On the next day at 10 p.m. EST, Binato's Twitter started posting, again in both English and Japanese, and there was approximately one tweet for each minute. What is this? I'm in some locked room somewhere, and the door won't open. I remember heading back home from college, but I straight up can't remember anything else. Someone kidnap me? There's a smartphone too, and it only connects to Twitter. And there's an account with my name. There's also this big box here with a number lock. And a paper here too that says solve the puzzle. Do I get to leave if I solve it? Seriously, what kind of escape game is this? This can't be happening. I can't believe this. Anyone reading this, solve this for me please. If you know the nine numbers, tell me. And then we get a picture which unlocks the next spell. It has a red frog, an orange bat, a black turtle, and a green rabbit with the word NEWS opposite it. Now, this puzzle was neat. First and foremost, if you took the letters in the word NEWS, you can see a sort of pattern here already. But let's lengthen it. North, East, West, South. And from this, we take the codes from the animals to our handy dandy Excel sheet to get the code 4134. Now, taking this, we would apply one code to the next. For north, we take the first number, 4, and count to the fourth letter in the word north, which is T. Then for east, we take the second number, 1, and so on and so forth. The word we get at the end of this is test, and so we input the Nirvana spell and get the following, 11724-7967. If you continue to prove proofs of proofs, eventually you will reach something unanswerable, something that is impossible to prove. Our existence is based on that unprovable something. Can any of us say that we really are alive if we exist on that foundation? Are you really alive? Can you prove it? We are alive because our brains emit electrical signals. What is that electrical signal? What is an electron? What is a subatomic particle? What is the universe? What does it mean to exist? Our existence is working backward from that unprovable end. What am we? We know. Until next time. And yes, what am we is what it says, and no. I do not believe this is a mistake. Uchikoshi stories are not strangers to having messages like this that grammatically don't make sense and tend to have a double meaning. Virtue's Last Reward has two right off the top of my head. Two milkmen go comedy, and if the ninth lion ate the sun. These each held double meanings and are each not technically correct. Similar to what happened with Aine, Binato's phone shuts off before we can get confirmation of what's inside the lockbox. As of the current moment, this is the most current event in the ARG, although there are a few things that have been deduced behind the scenes. This does constitute a spoiler for events that will play out 
as a test version of the Sonic Foundation website was found, and we got a look at what all of the monitors will end up saying when they're all lit on. If you want to keep this information secret until this happens in the story, here's the time code to skip to. Now that that's set, this is the image we have. So from top to bottom, left to right, we have Aine Ichirai about Lumina Rikujo, Kairo Gushiki, the Center Bats 489 monitor, Faya Hanadate, Mariha Monzen, Answer, and Binato Sotobara. So we know four new missing persons in addition to Aine and Binato, which kind of shelves the idea that their initials being Abyss means anything special. However, we get some very interesting information from this knowledge, and now we're going to go transition into the theory section of this video. Everything from here on out is theory, and not confirmed information, and could very well end up not being true. But, by being theory, I am attempting to guess what will happen, so if I am right with anything, I guess be warned now that you may have heard it here first. <laughs> anyway, I have a lot of stray thoughts, so I'm going to try to tackle this bit by bit. Theory 1, Date slash Ryuki. Theory 2, the truth of Sunaiku, missing persons, and the connection to Iris. Note, I'm going to be talking freely about endgame spoilers of I the Somnium files here for the very first theory and for the second, but I do mean that if you haven't seen the ending of the first game, you're done here. Skip over. Um, and also, in the second theory, I'm going to be talking specifically about some spoilers from Never7, as well as a related spoiler from its sequel, Ever17, the first and second games in the Infinity series of visual novels by Kid. What do 20-year-old visual novels have to do with I, the Somnium Files? Well, more than you might think. Kid was a development team that made quite a lot of visual novels in the heyday, and most relevant to our cause today being the Infinity series. This is the first set of stories that Kotaro Uchikoshi worked on as a lead writer. They weren't the first games he helmed as a director, though, as those would go on to be the Zero Escape games. But, do you know who did direct these games? At least a large chunk of them? Takumi Nakazawa. Not sure who he is? Well, he's currently the lead director of I, the Somnium Files Nirvana Initiative. Yeah, this game's not being directed by Uchikoshi, you guys. He's the lead scenario writer. But this is set up exactly like how things were back in the old days with the Infinity series. So, yeah, Uchikoshi already had plenty of parallels to the Infinity series before. We can only expect those to strengthen now. Second, the theory about the true nature of Sanaiku is going to involve elements of the first ARG, Lemnus Gate. If you are unfamiliar with the events of the ARG, or again, the late game elements of I-1, also similarly do not watch. These details are integral to the theories themselves, and this is your final warning. Got it? Okay, we're moving along. First, the relationship between Kaname Date and Karuto Ryuki. If you've played to the end of I the Somnium Files, you know Kaname Date's true name is not in fact Kaname Date, but in fact Hayato Yagyu. This was of course before he lost his memory after the Cyclops serial killings case and the six year period where he lived in the body of Saito Sejima. Which interestingly, he seems to be still inhabiting now, meaning this game's events do not immediately follow the true ending of I the Somnium Files. Hence why he's still going by Kaname Date, and not Hayato Yagyu. It's likely he does not remember his life as Yagyu, codenamed Falco. However, there is something interesting about that name, Yagyu. You see, in Japanese, Yagyu looks like this in kanji. This is intentional, as the kanji for Yagyu can also mean the numbers 8 and 9, ya -Q. Fitting, as Date's body throughout I-1 exists inhabited by Rohan Kumakura inside prison as a prisoner number 89. That's all fine, that's all stuff we've learned in the first game, you know, it's all dandy, but you know what else is a valid reading of this kanji? Hidden Bats over on the Somnium Files Discord pointed to a Tumblr post by Drain Bangle, who confirms an alternate reading of the kanji outside of Yagyu is... Ryuki. Now, with a visual similarity to a younger Hayato Yagyu already being interesting, the kanji of the name being able to read both ways is interesting. We have yet another connection in the fact that Ryuki's sprites practically one-to-one -one mirror Date's sprites as Date. We need more information, but there is a clear connection as to why Ryuki is so intertwined with Date, 
and I think it will have a lot to do with how he can use Tama, like how Date can use Aiba. Next, I'm going to be talking on all things Sonaiku. First and foremost is the smallest stuff comparably. I think it's likely that Date is working with the Sonaiku Foundation. They specify working with ex-police officers, and Date's appearance here suggests he's no longer a sinker with Abyss, and is doing his own thing without Aiba. Note that with Date's condition of being in Saito Sejima's body still, not having Aiba means he's not receiving the doses of medicine she had been giving him throughout Eye of the Somnium Files 1 to contain his hormone imbalances. This means it's very likely we see him behave in ways we're not immediately used to or agree with. And working alongside Sonaiku could be a result of that. Next, Sonaiku's connection with the Hidden Bats videos. So, we previously made the connection between Sonaiko to Hidden Bats to Horidori Institute, remember? Well, in Never 7, there is a character who goes missing, a girl, and before she is found, a geneticist makes a clone of her. Similarly, in the second Infinity Series game, Ever 17, the idea of clones also comes through the idea of a different scenario with a girl named Yu Tanaka. Basically, there are ideas that Uchikoshi and Nakazawa return to in new ways. We've got seeds for the concept of missing people connecting to geneticists who clone those people. It's possible that Sonaiku is doing the same thing. They're gathering as much resources as they can to assist in finding missing persons, but not immediately to reunite them with their loved ones as they may think, but perhaps to traffic them to Horidori to be cloned. Now, that by itself is an interesting theory, but I have some further proof. I'm going to swing by quickly to the Q&A segment that Uchikoshi held after the release of Virtue's Last Reward. I'm only going to specify a specific question so that this will not contain spoilers for Virtue's Last Reward, as Uchikoshi frequently gathers ideas of popular and not so popular thought experiments and quandaries that he uses them in interesting ways in his stories. Obviously, giving you examples here of ones that he has used would contain spoilers for the Zero Escape series, but here in this Q&A, he was asked if there were any that he didn't use. His answer is interesting. It wasn't a thought experiment, but on my notebook where I write down ideas, I also had the following. Dissipative system, Monty Hall problem, Godel's incompleteness theorems, toxoplasmosis, folie adieu, Cupgrass Delusion, Frigoli Delusion, Sally Ann Test, and Project MK Ultra. So, a few of these here ended up appearing in the next title in this Euroscape series, including Toxoplasmosis and the Monty Hall Problem, but we have two very interesting ones that I believe he's gone back to the well to use for Eye the Somnium Files, and now the Nirvana Initiative. The Frigoli Delusion is the idea that a complete stranger is someone you know in disguise. The misbelief that people you don't know are secretly the people that you do know that are hiding from you. This condition is named after the Italian actor Leopoldo Frigoli, who was renowned for his ability to make quick changes of appearance during his stage act. Now, this idea plays deeply into I the Somnium Files with the idea of body swapping, except it's the delusion played out into reality. It's not a delusion to think that Saito Tsujima is disguised as the dozens of people he body swaps as, He's literally becoming them. Date, too, subverts this delusion, being a stranger to his own body and yet the most familiar person to him. The next one is what interests me the most right now, the Cupcross delusion. The belief that the people around you, you know, have been systematically replaced by identical copies. Or clones. So hear me out. It's Sonaiku is working to funnel missing persons cases to Horidori to create clones, this delusion can once again be subverted. This goes along with the idea of the theme of the game being fact versus fiction, truth versus illusion, dreams versus reality, in believing the delusion even though it seems like it's the most stupid thing to do, and yet it becoming the right answer for the best possible outcome. Also, remember the purple haired lady we saw in the last two trailers, Tokiko Shigure? Well, we have two pieces of information that may link her directly to Sonaiku. First is this screenshot where Tama is investigating Tokiko's Somnium, and one of the tasks is to decipher the book and find I. Now, it's most likely not artificial intelligence she's looking for, but possibly the location of Aine Ichirai, AI, the missing high school student who we were communicating with on Twitter. 
very suspicious. Why would she know where Aine is? Maybe because she's involved with some IQ. Secondly though, and more interesting, is what's known as Gorowase. This is a type of Japanese wordplay where the specific pronunciation of words can have hidden meanings or jokes. This is common in Japanese literature and is integral within Zero Escape and even with an I itself. The previous theory had an instance of this with Yagyu being comprised of the hiragana for the numbers 8 and 9. Ya, Q. Sugure, on the other hand, is another example of this. It's comprised of Shi, Q, Rei. The Japanese pronunciations of the numbers 4, 9, and 0. 490. Where do we see that number before? Oh shit, it's past 490! And this would explain why Ryuki is asking Shigure specifically about the Bats 490 video. Although my guess is this is before he ever suspects that she has anything to do with it. So, Tokiko Shigure is related to the Sonaiku Foundation, which is investigating the disappearance of Aina Ichirai, and Tama is investigating Tokiko's Somnium for the location of someone named AI. Seems definitely fishy and almost confirmed that the Sonaiku Foundation aren't exactly as benevolent in their searches which is why they were so insistent on not naming the person named I in the news section. Why name the person you're helping to keep missing in clone? So, what can we do with this information? Well, let's take it one step further. Have you noticed a weird connection with the Sonaiku Foundation? Has there been something strange eating away at you that you can't place? Let me spill the beans. There's a connection to Iris. She is at the heart of this issue. Now, don't get me wrong, I don't believe that she's the puppet master behind the organization, or evil, or responsible, or anything like that. It doesn't obviously make any sense of why that would be, but I just want to be clear of what I'm saying here. There's a startling amount of connections from the Sonaiku Foundation to Iris. Let's list them all out. First, the homepage has an image of a rainbow. By itself, it's not the strangest thing in the world, but you have to ask yourself, why? None of their messaging says anything about rainbows. However, there is one character who is intrinsically linked to rainbows. Iris. Iris is named after the Greek goddess of rainbows and is the bridge to the gods, or in our case, the bridge of the world to the ARG and the video game. She was the main character in the entirety of the Lemonsgate ARG. Again, Another Infinity series illusion, as a Lemnus Gate, is literally an infinity symbol, and also comes with the double meaning of all-seeing or always-watching. Iris also has a song dubbed Invincible Rainbow Arrow, which, of course, in Rainbow here is in the title, but some of the lyrics have a lot of references to time, the travel through such, and immortality. This old tale of mine, a journey through time, a permanent fire, cold frost on the pyre, Fruit never expires. The marble loses shine. The eye clouds by design. That if we believe we can, we can make miracles. Even with the devils of time against you. Okay, so here. We have a few different lyrics that are interesting for a few different reasons. Obviously, the easiest ones to discern here are about a permanent fire, fruit that never expires, journeys through time, and mention of the devils of time. These bring to mind the ideas of eternity, permanence, and immortality, which is exactly the center of the Nirvana Initiative. Nirvana in Buddhist context is a spiritual freeing from the human state of suffering and immortality and timelessness. It's the entire theme of this game. Know who else wants a freedom from immersed emotional turmoil? The Sunaiku Foundation. They state themselves that they want to eradicate the sorrow and eliminate the tragedy of missing persons cases. It's literally the main motivation for their foundation. They are literally searching for the Nirvana Initiative. The next lyric I want to look at is the one that mentions the eye clouding by design. This here is an interesting phrase. It calls to mind the idea of humanity seeing things one way by design. But the song mentions that it isn't wholly correct. It's clouded. Basically, the idea of whatever you assume true on your initial grasp isn't necessarily the truth, no matter how natural it may seem to be. Keep this thought in mind for one second, because I'm going to bring it up again. 
The last lyric, that if we believe we can, we can make miracles, is a bit of a cliché, the whole I can do it kind of mentality, but it's also a bit of a reference to something from Never Seven's ending, if not directly meant to be. Without going into too much detail, the story of Never Seven involves a character, Makoto, going through a loop in time of about a week and finding out that he's able to repeat events and experience premonitions of the future to try to save one of the other characters from a grisly fate by changing history. It turns out, though, that at the end of the story, the time loop, as Makoto originally believed it, was not entirely accurate. That he was being led to believe he could see premonitions of the future by the villain of the story. He was being deluded into thinking he could see the future. And that theorem they were testing was the ability of delusion to affect reality, that by believing Makoto could have premonitions of the future and witnessing his desire to change reality, he was able to have legitimate premonitions and change reality. He was able to manifest his desires by being deluded into thinking he could already manifest his desires. Literally believing one can make miracles allows miracles to be made in this exact manner. While something of this specific nature is not exactly shown to happen thus far in Nirvana Initiative's marketing, there is one part of it that so far has come up and has come up in this very script, and that's the believing delusions part and delusions affecting reality. I spoke earlier about how the Frigoli delusion was subverted for I-1, and how I believe the Copgras delusion was going to be subverted for the Nirvana Initiative. We, I believe, are seeing a pattern here. Our eyes are naturally clouded because delusion to us says untrustworthy. It says to not follow down this path of logic, to steer clear, to avoid, to heed caution, however you want to say it. Well, what if I told you there is one delusion that we all fell for, that our eyes were all clouded for? And what do you know? It relates back to Iris. During the Lemnus 8 ARG, we are told of a secret society of devil worshippers known as Knights at Lots. They exist outside of common law space and operate to their heart's desires free from legal trouble in a space similar to what's known as the Bohemian Grove, a place for the rich to do as they please without fear of repercussion. The early stages of the ARG hint towards Knights at Lotsian interference and attempts to silence and censor Iris from talking about them and revealing them to the world. But then, as events with B-Set, ergo the version of Iris that's actually Saito Sejima inside her body, take over the spotlight of the ARG. And the Knights at Lot's plot point is kind of hushed to the back as more pressing themes come up. Well, they crop back up in the game, but as a twist, it's revealed to be a delusion on Iris's part due to a brain tumor that she's had since she was a young girl that her headphones were helping keep a balance on. That's it. Knights is a red herring. Just a delusion of a wacky YouTuber. That's what we thought, but I'm proposing that Knights is very much real, and is very much exact messaging we are being told again and again. Trust the delusions. Frigoli. Copgrass. Nice at lots. You want proof that Knights' influence is still felt in the game this far out? Let me show you proof. First, we have a tweet from Spike Chunsok that shows Ryuki at Bloom Park in the merry-go-round where Shoko Nadami was found dead in the previous game. The caption of the tweet is, where it all began. Now, this tweet sounds normal, right? <laughs> well, let me tell you, this ain't even the beginning of it. So yes, it's obvious this inclusion is that it's referencing this area where I-1 began and Date as a detective began here after his case six years ago. However, the less obvious reference, and the infinitely more interesting one, is about Bloom Park and the specific merry-go-round. But, before the events of I the Somnium Files, this very park and this very merry-go-round appeared in the Lemnus Gate ARG, when Iris snuck into Bloom Park to talk about ghost stories. One of those ghost stories told of the disappearance of a young girl. Let's see that again. Good evening, good morning, and hello! It's the sneaky superstar of the net, Tessa, aka Aset. Today, we're here! We're going to explore an abandoned amusement park, so I have to be quiet. And of course, I'm Trespassing! 
amazing! That reminds me of an urban legend my mom told me once. A family was visiting this very amusement park, and their little girl was riding the merry-go-round. They gave her a cell phone with GPS on it so that she wouldn't get lost in the park. It had an alarm set on it so their phones would beep if she got too far away. Anyway, there she was, riding the horse, smiling and waving, and the whole time, the dad was filming on his cell phone. But for some reason, on camera, her face was blurred out, like she was missing her head. The dad was terrified. He was sweating bullets and shaking, just waiting for the ride to end. But the merry-go-round spun for one more turn. She went around the column, and then... Beep! The GPS alarm went off. When the horse came back around, it was empty. Their little girl was totally gone. It was like she had never been there. The mom and dad couldn't believe their eyes. They checked the GPS, but it said she was still right there on the ride. But they didn't find her or the phone. When they tried to call her, the phone was off. They even texted her, but that didn't work either. They were about to give up completely, but then they got a mysterious text. It said, Daddy? Mommy? I can't find my head! A few years later, after the amusement park closed, they were breaking down the rides and stuff. When the workers were digging under the merry-go-round, they discovered the skull of an elementary school child. They kept digging, of course, but they never found the rest of the skeleton. <laughs> Maybe it's linked to Nizet Laws! Nizet Laws, or Nize, is a devil-worshipping demon cult. They do ritual sacrifices and torture, dancing into the night around satanic bonfires. Their members are important people, like politicians, businessmen, and to the little and the group is so big, no one knows who their higher-ups are. No one knows who's running it. Okay, wait. Excuse me? We have to talk about this. This is the first reported instance of the half-body disappearances. No? You see that, right? A young girl completely vanishes as if she's been teleported away. Her GPS location still shows her at that same exact location, but her parents couldn't see her at all. Her head, a portion of her body, but not all of it, is found buried underground under the merry-go-round, meaning she was buried in a time before the merry-go-round was built. Her head went back in time, and it may not even been buried. It's possible it fused with the ground, similar to how the story of the Philadelphia experiment, where the sailors were said to have fused with the barges after the ship had been teleported. She could have, excuse my lack of a better word, no clipped into the ground, and the rest of her body ended up in some other future time. Hell, maybe in Nirvana Initiative we'll see a skeletal body of a young girl who is missing a head. Plus, it's very interesting to note that a young girl carried a phone with her, and she was able to text on it. Remember how Aine and Binato were given phones that worked for a short period of time? It's possible that these phones are the key to how the modern half-body killings are happening. I mean, Jin Fururay's right half was seen caught on fire. Maybe it was something to do with the phone. But you see what this means, right? Iris heard this story and broadcasted it on her YouTube channel. And it's directly after she tells the story that she talks to us for the very first time about nights. And it's the first time that we see interruptions and interference in her video. These two events are connected. So here, I have to talk a little bit about this. During the Lemniscate ARG, it's left up to interpretation the level of censorship and interference as it's theoretically possible that Iris technically could have done it all in post, if we were believing the theory that Knights is not real. Or that Saito could have done it inside Tessa's body as B-set. However, thinking more on it with current context, 
Neither of these really make sense. Iris is a very passionate YouTuber. She's a very kind soul, and she's not the kind of person to lie for clicks or edit lies about herself. And she's also gone on record stating that she uploads videos as is. If she edited them, she would have deleted the very public video of her own death or the sixth video. Now, for Saito, what purpose would he have to censor Iris about knights? Why would he care if Iris talks about knights? He has his own fun on the channel as B said, so I'm not negating that. But what connection does he have to knights? The answer is none. He's a separate agent. He's a separate conflict. He has zero reason to censor Iris. And furthermore, he doesn't even appear on the channel until after GDC, when Knights has previously uploaded censorships in the previous episodes. So going by that logic, Saito would have somehow had access to Iris's YouTube channel before he got in her body. Why would he do that? It doesn't make sense, and therefore I'm going to say it wasn't Saito that was editing the videos. It wasn't Iris that was editing the videos. The simplest explanation after all this is that Knights does exist and is able to remotely tamper with technology and gain access to video feeds. How is this possible? I'll explain that in a bit as there is an answer that I am satisfied with and it will lead to some shocking possibilities. First though, we need to continue with the thought process of Knights editing Iris' videos. They would do this if they're trying to keep their activities out of the public focus, which, on a popular YouTube's front page, that would be very concerning to them. One method that they've used to communicate for Iris to stop is by QR codes. The video thumbnail for the video 6 has a bisected QR code with the left half in the top left of the screen and the right half and the lower right. Now, where have we seen this kind of visual indicator before? Hmm, I don't know. It's really unique and I've never seen anything like it before. All kidding aside, here again we have a tie to Knights. Missing persons reports and this idea of bisection. Next, I want to bring up something small but the logo for I the Somnium Files and the Nirvana Initiative have been hiding something in plain sight to us for all this time. You can spell out the name Knights using it. Here, 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 and here. Finally is the name of the Sunaiku Foundation. Sunaiku is an anagram, if you haven't guessed, something Uchikoshi loves putting into his works. And it's an anagram of Nakusu, the Japanese shorthand for Nikes. Yes, it really is. And it makes sense of why this would be. Listen, if you're a top secret organization that's not afraid of killing people, and some teenager is spilling exactly all your secrets, you'd not hesitate to silence her immediately, right? I mean, they supposedly did that to all their other victims, what makes Iris so special? Why are they playing kind of light with it, just kind of giving spooky warnings? Well, say you have a brain tumor, and maybe you miss a few details here and there. Instead of the Sonaika Foundation, the name for the group you're spreading rumors about is Knights. And since you're huge into urban legends, you relate it to the Zoltaxian urban legend. I mean, it's the same backward, right? Knights at Lots, Zoltaxian. So what if you're monitoring someone remotely and you find someone spreading rumors of mostly correct information? You would definitely try to urge them to stop, but silencing them would probably bring more people interested in finding out what she was talking about. You wouldn't necessarily silence them unless you absolutely needed to. This is how I think they'll avoid spoiling I-1 with the tumor, the twist with Knights of Lots not being quote-unquote real, and Sonaiku will be Sonaiku, but I think that they'll be who Iris was thinking of as Knights. And finally, how would one foundation be able to remotely affect, monitor, and teleport people away through technology? I did mention I theorized it was through their electronic equipment, after all. Remember some of the iconic symbols we've been seeing thus far? 
the infinity symbol, the eyes of a lemnus gate, always watching, all seeing, the left eye of Horus, the ideas of these tie into the singular most important technological system in the world of Ibisomnium files, the Watchet system. The Watchet system was developed by an American tech conglomerate known as Elgord. American tech conglomerate, remember, which we know Sunaiku has an American branch in Philadelphia, and thus there's a chance of them to collaborate. Now, the Watchet system has the ability to gaze into parallel universes, even if the user doesn't necessarily know that they're doing it, a la Date's ability to shift in the endgame of I-1, or how he knew about the taxi driver in a timeline he hadn't met him yet. So with all of this, I assume that the ability to remotely tap into technology would be a much easier feat if it was within the same world, much less through time. And that, my friends, is what leads me to believe that the end game of I, the Somnian Files, the Nirvana Initiative, we are going to see the Wadget system used against us. Iba and Tama will be overwritten, and we may have to put them down permanently. And that is all I have at the current moment. If anything else crops up, I'll add it to the new script, and as soon as enough happens, I'll release a part 2 to this. And I'm also going to get to work on finishing I, the Somnian Files Explained, so there isn't as much forewarning on the spoiler sections. But with that, I want to thank you all for listening to me ramble about this for an extended period of time. And for y'all, have a good day. Until next time.